The Detroit Automobile Company was founded in 1899 by Henry Ford. You're going to know that name. He's pretty famous. But he wasn't famous for the Detroit Automobile Company. Like many automobile companies in those days, and that one was the fourth to be established in the United States. It wasn't very successful. So he basically restructured the company to be called, become the Henry Ford Company. He had a lot of trouble with his investors and he eventually just pulled out of the company completely. Once he left, it was rebranded as Cadillac. Cadillac was named after Antoine de la Muth Cadillac, who was a French explorer, and he founded the city of Detroit in Michigan. Cadillac was fairly successful, but in 1909, it became prey for a certain William Crapo Durant. I've talked about him before. He founded General Motors, in 1908. He went on a spending spree, buying companies. He bought 23 in all, automobile companies and parts supply companies. And Cadillac was one of the first in 1909 that the company bought. Cadillac went on, of course, by the 1930s to be known as the standard of the world. They built some of the world's most beautiful and epic cars ever and their uh, V16 Leviathan monsters were truly incredible. After the war, it's probably safe to say that Cadillac's fortunes, although good, they were no longer the standard of the world, and they became probably most famous in the late 50s and early 60s. If you asked anybody around the world to draw a Cadillac for a Martian. They would probably draw something with huge rear fins on it and color it pink. From those crazy days, Cadillac then became more and more absorbed into the General, General Motors fodder. And by the 80s, they were pretty much relegated to producing cars like the Cimarron, which was based off the J-Car platform and was essentially gussied up Cavalier. They did the same thing in the 1990s with the Katira, the caddy that zigs famously, which was none other than a, a, a fancy Opel Omega. That wasn't a particularly great car but the car that replaced it was, and that was a complete new departure for Cadillac in building sporty rear wheel drive sedans that could compete with the German Q marks, <coughs> Audi, BMW, and Mercedes. The CTS in 2003 was a huge success. It was, such a better car in every respect in handling and ride compared to everything before it that it was hard to imagine it as a Cadillac. The second generation CTS began life in around 2008 and General Motors were, were pretty much paying the price big time for all of the mistakes that they had made over the previous two decades and which led to their bankruptcy in 2010. After that, the company rationalized and uh, Cadillac became much more focused. The art and science design theme probably hit its peak around 2012. And that's when this car was debuted. This is an ATS and the ATS put an end to Cadillac's misguided thinking of creating a car which was the size of a 5 Series for the price of a 3 Series. It performed an awful lot of research itself and came to the conclusion that's not what customers wanted. They wanted a direct competitor. 
And so the ATS was born. The car was largely engineered in Germany. The platform, the Alpha platform was all new. It has McPherson suspension at the front and a five link independent suspension at the rear. It was extensively tested against the likes of the BMW 3 Series. And what they produced, in my opinion, was probably the biggest underdog of the small executive market. And yet it was the closest to a 3 Series in terms of the way it drove that you could buy. I'm Darren Walker. And this is Auto Atlantica. So the ATS was the same size as the 3 Series and it was priced in 3 Series territory as well. It's rear wheel drive, although you could have all wheel drive as well. It comes with three different engines. It began with a base 2.5 litre four cylinder producing 202 horsepower with an optional two litre turbo producing 272 horsepower. That's what this car is. Furthermore, you could also specify it with the LFX 3.6 from the SRX. And in this application, that produced 351 horsepower. Now in 2016, the LFX engine was replaced by the LGX and that produced 335 horsepower, which uh, tremendous for a car like this. Then the beast of them all was the V. That used a 3.6 litre twin turbo, pumping out 488 horsepower. The transmission in all of the standard cars came from a six speed automatic. However, the turbo, which this is, could also be offered with a six speed Tremec manual. This is the first application of the Alpha platform. The third generation CTS also used it. And then it went on to be used by the sixth generation Camaro from 2018, 2019 or so, which is what I've got. And it's just look at this swage line that goes around from the boot over these haunches and then melds with the bottom of the windows. It's a beautiful design theme The that then incorporates the vertical Cadillac tail lights, which is a trademark of Cadillac, all LEDs, of course. The, this spoiler in court is basically the high level brake light, which it incorporates along much of its length. The same kind of design theme that's on the trunk also extends from the bottom of the A pillars and then flows into the hood right here with these headlights that start almost halfway up the hood and then roll down almost vertically. Up front uh, you've got these uh, swathes of chrome which also flank the uh, ventilation vents too and they cut across to the the middle of the dashboard which i'll show you in just a second but first i'm going to concentrate on the instruments themselves this instrument panel uh, became standard on the ats the cts the srx from 2012 or so very very nice very functional very easy on the eye and you've got a strip that encompasses your trip computer at the bottom. You can tailor the center display to whatever you want, along with the, the two side displays as well. These were connected to Cadillac's IntelliLink system called CUE. This is the like a base car which does not have the optional 8-inch display for the CUE. This is the standard 5-inch display. All of these buttons on the center console are touch sensitive for the heater controls and the heated rear window, uh, the AC, etc. And uh, for the stereo as well, though the stereo, you can also use these two chunky knobs in the middle. So the six speed automatic shifts from here 
and then you can turn the traction control off there if you want a bit of fun and here's the mode button for the all-wheel drive so you press that and you've got uh, the uh, tour mode which i believe is rear wheel drive only Press that again sport i think is all-wheel drive and then snow and ice is an end we go snow and ice is an enhanced version of the all-wheel drive system the seats in cadillacs are absolutely tremendous and everywhere you get this art and science v symbol it's even on the bottom of the head restraints and you get a little chrome swathe in the middle of the seat there they are really epic seats they're very comfortable they offer a lot of support and you get full electric control on both sides. With this being a base car, you didn't even get heated seats as standard, which I thought was a little bit cheap. There's no heated steering wheel either. You do get full Bluetooth, of course, and cruise control and basics like that. It's got OnStar navigation which you have to subscribe to, but there's no built-in other navigation at all. And the OnStar navigation is essentially a voice series of voice commands that uh, you download. So yeah, it's a very basic car in, in that respect. I'm surprised that they, uh, whoever bought it was interested in driving the thing, I think, rather than the creature comforts. Uh, it, despite the fact that they kept the automatic. Automatic, of course, is certainly better around uh, uh, cities. But um, I'd have probably gone with the Tremec manual, but that's just me. Let's take it for a spin, shall we, and see what this thing's all about. You do have a Tiptronic setting on uh, here as well, and um, you can just push up and down through the gears. Tell you what, let's try that. This road is a little bit bumpy, so I'm trying not to shake the camera too much. So we're not going to hoon it, especially since it's not my car. I don't think Jane would be very happy with me if uh, if I turned, turned up with it looking like something from Jackass the movie. While the ride isn't bad, you can tell that this car has been focused purely on its handling capabilities. I'm going to try and find a road that's not quite as rutted because it's playing havoc with my camera. But at the same time, a car like this is designed for roads like this through these Pennsylvanian hills. I just want to try and give you an idea of just how good this car is on roads like this. Um, it's very quiet, it's very refined, this car. The turbo is very quick to spool in, there's no lag. And the auto does not hunt for gears at all, it finds its place very quickly, and it just takes you right where you want to go. And trust me, you need to try one of these. It is the closest to a 3 Series you will find in any other car, save for probably the Lexus IS. And especially from this point in time. It's very quiet, engine noise is an absolute minimum. There's no road noise, barely, at all. It's, it's an extraordinarily refined car. Now, when these were new, they retailed at between 30 and 40,000. And like I say, you could option these right up. There's an awful lot you could do with this. If you had, for instance, with this car, if you went for the larger screen with the navigation, etc., and heated seats and heated steering wheel and parking sensors outside and lane assist and that kind of thing, you could be, you'd be touching 50 grand or more very, very quickly indeed. 
General Motors spent an awful lot of time de developing this Alpha platform in Germany. They wanted to get the Q car feel as best as they could manage. And they did an amazing job of it. Their engineers just did a superb job. The best part about it is, is that you can pick up used ATSs. This one's got 44,000 on it. Now for less than 20,000 easily, 15,000. And I think that that represents a considerable value for money. So in order to preserve my camera, what we're gonna do now is just give it some welly. Now I'm not quite sure why they went to an eight speed automatic in 2016, two years after this car was built, other than the fact that it was de rigueur for automatics to have eight, nine and 10 speeds at the time. I suspect one reason why they did it is to add a bit more flexibility in that Tiptronic, because the one thing that I did notice is that it was a little bit laggy in its response. It wasn't really that sharp, not like VW Audi sharp, for instance, but it brought a smile to my face. So there we have it. A 2014 Cadillac ATS for your viewing pleasure and possible driving pleasure as well. I've really enjoyed my couple of hours with this car. It's been an awful lot of fun, more than I thought it would be. And I've driven one before many years ago and I was very, very impressed then with its driving dynamics. And they're still as relevant today as they were back then. It is a wonderful car for the money, very underrated. The other beauty about this compared with a German Q car is that it's not a German Q car. What you've got here is just something that's much more of an underdog. You're not going to likely see it so often on the road either. And if you show up at a Cars and Coffee, especially with a V version, chances are you're going to get talked to a lot more as well. Uh, this particular one, I like the extra bling on it. Those wheels are optional and these little chrome, I think they're just basically stuck on. They've been added, they're, they're not even a factory option. They've just been added by a previous owner. But I like it because I like bling. I'm Darren Walker and this is Auto Atlantica.